welcome to Head Start, the podcast for race directors and the business of putting on races. It's another bonus episode for you today, and as we were discussing reducing your race's carbon footprint last week, this week's episode falls quite neatly in the same area of sustainability and decarbonization. Today, I'm joined by race director, race timer, and solar power enthusiast, Lower Lads of 2L Race Services, to talk about how you can switch your race day headquarters over to solar power so that your entire race day operation runs on sun juice instead of diesel. We're going to be looking at the stepping stones to building out a solar power setup, from getting started on a single solar generator to gradually building out a full-fledged mobile solar power station. And we're going to be answering your questions on the feasibility, reliability and cost of such a setup when it comes to powering race day. Before we go into all that, though, I want to give a quick shout out to our hugely supportive podcast sponsor, Run Sign Up, race director's favorite all-in-one technology solution for endurance and fundraising events. More than 26,000 in-person, virtual and hybrid events use Run Sign Up's free and integrated solution to save time, grow their events and raise more. If you want to learn more about Run Signups, awesome suite of race day tools and other features, you can do so at runsignup.com. But now, let's dive straight into our discussion on building out a solar powered race day setup with Low Light. Lowell, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks a lot for coming on. Where are you based? I am based in Westchester, Pennsylvania. Awesome. And you are the owner of uh, 2L Ray Services. I should say your your full name is Lowell Ladd. So I guess that the 2L comes from that, Lowell Ladd Ray Services, which is pretty cool. And from what I understand, like like many people listening in, you wear uh, two hats. You're both a race director and a timer. So you direct races and you time races. Is that right? That is correct. Yep. I started with race directing and got into timing shortly thereafter. And just out of curiosity, what got you to um, to go into timing? Was it like a side income type thing? How exactly did that transition happen for you? I decided to start my own marathon in 2011. So the idea for that hatched when I was doing someone else's marathon in 2010. And I thought, I'd like to put on a race. So I started my own marathon, hired a timer, started a half marathon that fall, hired a timer, and then decided... I'm ready to bring it in-house. And so the initial intent was just to time our own events. But once you purchase equipment, you realize that, hey, you might as well use it a bit more. And it just kind of had legs of its own. And so now I wear both hats, sometimes at the same time, usually separately. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's. I guess that's what happens with people. You get the equipment, you want to amortize it, you start timing other races. It's a, the natural, the natural thing to do. And in terms of the races you direct for yourself and others, what's your portfolio looking there? So I initially started the Gettysburg North-South Marathon in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, and that led to starting a half marathon in the same town in 2011. Um, Over time, we've consolidated those two events into a single festival of races, so marathon, half marathon, 5K. That's currently the only event that I own and operate, but over the years, there have been some events that... I have timed for that have asked me to expand my role because I have a background in event management. So usually it's a group that puts on a race and realizes that they just want somebody else to deal with operations, dealing with municipalities, police, whatever it is, they they want somebody else to, to help manage some of that. So I sometimes take over pieces of it. And then I've also put on soup to nuts events for conventions when they've come into the area. And and I have to ask, because we are coming out of the pandemic, and it's a question I ask all my guests, how are things looking on your end sort of around this time? It's fall 2022, must must be a busy season by you know historical standards. How's it looking for you? We've been very busy all year. We were actually, we pivoted pretty well early on in the pandemic, and we stayed very busy with track and field and high school cross-country timing competitions. We had our own events, and I also know some race directors that were able to pull off their events in weird modified ways for a while pretty early on. But right now, it's full on. It's totally normal, and we're crazy busy. I'm very glad to hear that. So the reason uh, for uh, today's podcast, I reached out to you um, a week ago or so because I saw that post you uh, published in our race directors hub group very proudly displaying the solar power setup you put together on your van people want to check that out or people who may have checked that out already it's your 
little white trailer, not a van, it's, it's a trailer with solar panels on top. And then you have pictures of all the different bits and pieces you have on it. And I did uh, realize that more people are probably doing this or are interested in this, the whole aspect of switching to solar power, because there were quite a few comments on that. Lots of people starting, you know, like throwing technical jargon around. So I thought, why don't we do like a, a short episode for everyone who might be interested in knowing a little bit more about this? So you can tell us a little bit more about what's the reason behind doing this and, and how it works and maybe get people off to a head start as it is who want to build their own system. Right. I mean, I I have no professional training in this area. I, I dabbled in it for a little while. I took a big step this year, had a ton of fun with it. I really enjoy playing solar um, and going green. And I think a lot of other people like the idea of it, and they really just need a little bit of a nudge to get into it, either a little or maybe more, depending on you know their interest and their background and what they're comfortable with. But a lot of it is just taking that first step and getting into it and having a try at it. Yeah, I guess lots of people would actually be interested, I suspect. So do you want to give us like, just to begin with, a, a kind of like overview of your project and sort of what exactly you did? Right. So I've been using batteries for years to back up various timing things. From the very beginning, you, you got to have a battery backup because you can't risk something crit critical piece of equipment going down on you, especially if you're in the track and field or cycling timing world with cameras. They, they don't have normally an internal battery. So you got to have a backup. And this year I looked at you know, taking some battery options and could we get some solar power? And so I started with some portable units, the ones that I, in, I started with were Jackery. They're made by the company Jackery, which is pretty popular in the off-grid camping world where people want to um, either camp with a tent or camp with a light trailer, and they want to be able to power some things for days. And, you know, they're not going to plug in. They might not be going to campsites that have grid power. So they want to get some energy from the sun and they buy a couple panels and, and run off of that. So this spring, I really dove into that and embraced kind of the lightweight portable entry into the solar world. And I bought one really small jackery unit and then once that worked out and that could only power a little bit of equipment so i was using it at track meets and it was basically powering my cameras and the switch that connected them to my computer so if i lost the generator that that would still be going and then once that was working i bought a bigger jackery and i realized okay now i can power my clock on site and i can make it through say a four hour track meet and then i went and bought a bigger jackery and i realized i could go almost all day with this, especially if there's sun outside, I could run pretty much all day. And then this summer, I'm not quite sure what gave me the itch, but I realized that, you know, I have a trailer, which not everybody does, but a fair number of event managers and, and timers have trailers. And I've seen pictures of people that put, you know, solar panels on their trailer. And I thought, I've got some real estate up there. Why don't I get a system and let's get this thing wired up, you know, with a permanent installation of solar so I can really do some bigger, more interesting things with it. So up until this summer, you weren't using solar panels. I only used them very lightly at track and field competitions. So it wasn't critical. I would have a, you know, a jacker unit that could be a standalone battery, but I could plug it. it. I bought it with panels, small portable folding panels, and they could be set up on the ground to extend how long I could last running on that unit without having to use a generator. But it was all portable. and Right. So, so Jackery, just so I understand, which was how you started out, was just a battery, basically, right? It was just you would, you would charge it overnight or before you went out to an event or something, and then you would just have that power, all of that equipment you mentioned. Right. The Jackery is a battery that has an inverter. And what the inverter does is it gives you outlets. So you could plug in things that need grid power, whether it's a laptop computer or a switch to connect your cameras to. Uh, the Jackery, Jackery units usually have USB plugs. So you can plug in an iPad or phone or MiFi hotspot to, to power those as well. And then they have input plugs for panels, which is totally optional. So those all-in-one units can usually be charged by grid power ahead of time. You can plug it into your car or truck and charge it while you're driving to the site, although it is going to take a while to, to charge those large batteries up, or you can charge it off panels um, before, and you can plug in panels you know, while you're using it to extend how long it can last. And for people, I'm thinking mostly race directors, sort of like pure race directors here, who are not very experienced with the timing side of things, who may wonder, 
why on-site power may be insufficient for the for the kinds of stuff you need to power. Is there a reason for that? Like why you wouldn't just go around and just plug yourself in at the at the track venue that you were or around the start line somewhere? Right. I, I've put on races and timed in so many different uh, locations that I don't tr really trust anyone to provide me with anything, whether it's grid power or internet. I'm always pre prepared to provide my own. So uh, for years, I would always have a generator with me. Uh, if there's grid power, I will gladly use it because someone else is paying for it. And it's quieter than a generator when I was using a generator. Um, but now that I have the solar, you know, I don't really have to rely on anyone else for anything. In the event management world, you know, the, the biggest exception, and we can go more into this later, or maybe I'm jumping ahead, but um, audiovisual tends to be the, the items that are going to draw a lot more electricity than you might be able to power with solar unless you have a huge setup. Things like heavy duty sound, heavy duty video displays, things like that are going to draw a lot of power. And you still power those. I mean, I would have imagined that those things like, you know, like fixed big LED panels or speakers or PA systems would have to run off on-site power. You're saying you would still go out prepared to run those off the back of your own power supply. You'd have to do the math on do you have enough battery and solar power to panel those for as long as you need to. A lot of it depends on how long is the event. If you're talking about a small 5K event with a short window of time when you're not running things for very long, you might be able to do it off of solar. If you're talking about doing a 24-hour ultra marathon, which I time several of those, and you're going to go there, if you're going to set up PA systems and LED boards and run them for 24 hours, it's going to be exceptionally difficult to have solar and batteries. Because if you're talking 24 hours, you're running overnight. So you're going to have a period of time, even in the summer, when you're not generating any electricity off the sun, and you just have to draw off your reserves in the batteries. So first step in your transition was move away from the generator, which I'm, I'm guessing run off of like gasoline or diesel or something like that. So you move away from that. And then you buy yourself those jackeries that you start scaling up, which are essentially, I, I guess I, I look them up, they call them sort of solar generators. But as you say, the solar bit is sort of optional. It's basically correct electric generator. They're like a battery, which as you say, with an inverter and some outlets where you can plug stuff in. And then you decide to take the extra step and start installing first the lightweight panels and then sort of like the fixed panels on the trailer. Most people, I guess, would be doing that on sustainability grounds, mostly. I guess that's, you know, that's, that's one of the big selling points of solar power and seeing where, where gas prices are these days cost as well. Were any of those two factors a motivation for you in moving deeper into the, into the solar energy? The cost of gas going up as high as it has has been a small piece of it. Uh, part of it, too, is the hassle of having to get gasoline. Uh, when I have a solar setup, I do need to remember to charge my things, although I can pull out the panels on site and you know do some of that while I'm setting up for an event. But it is nice not to have to worry about is the gas can in the back of my truck filled up. If I need to get gas, if I'm going to where I'm from, I can fill my own gas cans. If I cross the river into New Jersey, there they have to fill up your gas cans. And there's certain gas stations there where they won't fill up a generator or they won't fill up gas cans. So it gets complicated. Just being free of the gas is really nice. And I don't know when it kicks in, but I believe that the state of California has actually banned portable generators, uh, the sale of them. So people that have them already, no problem. I'm not sure when that when goes into place. And people, of course, can just cross into Arizona and buy them there. So it's it's a long way off from when gas guzzling generators are going to be banned you know, all over the place. But the process has begun. And I like to be out ahead of things and doing some trying some cutting edge stuff. And I have to say, you know, when I first started this, when I'm just running off a of jackery by itself, people don't think anything of it. They don't really think about where you're getting your power from. They don't pay attention to what's plugged in where. If they see the panels out, then they're like, whoa, you're running this off solar. That's awesome. Like people say that all the time. They see solar panels next to my canopy at event. They're like, that is awesome. You're running off solar panels. And hey, I don't hear a generator. You know, noise, no noise from that. That's awesome too. So it is fun to to do awesome things outside of the the dollars and cents piece of the equation. So the people giving you the compliments and the wows and stuff, are they sort of the participants or the people hiring you? Both. That would be both. Anybody that sees solar, because 
nobody's doing it. I mean, it has not been done at these type of events that somebody's pulling out solar power. So when they see that, they don't even realize that you can do that. You know, a lot of people think, hey, I can put solar panels on my house and do it that way. But they don't really think about using solar power port in a portability way. Speaking of which, have you also done this on your house? Seeing as you have the expertise and the... I have not. No, you haven't. I have not. Now, I don't really want to get on my roof and try to mount panels on the roof of my house. Uh, if I did it for my house, which I we probably will, that's a large undertaking. It's kind of it's kind of all or nothing. So you're not really going to dabble in it and take small steps. The way I did it, I started very small and I took a lot of steps over time. If you're going to do your house, you're going to do an energy audit. You're going to look at, you know, what direction it's facing, how many you can put on there. You're, you're going to really do the math on how long does it take to pay for itself. And then you're going to make a decision to drop tens of thousands of dollars or not. And did you have any experience in solar power systems or any of that stuff before you fitted your trailer? None. I knew nothing about different types of panels. I didn't really very well understand the difference between AC and DC power, different gauge wires, all that. I really did not know until I dove into this and started learning on the fly. And how did you learn? Is there some kind of like online resource you looked up or a book or learn from someone else? There are some good Facebook groups. There are some very good YouTube videos. And one of the YouTubers has a book out there called Solar Power Solar Power for Beginners. Uh, his name's Will Prowse. I think he's out of Nevada or something like that. And he's really good. He's very down to earth in all his videos talking about how to do things, um, how to do it the right way, how to do it the safe way and not make mistakes. And also dumbing it down for true beginners because it's so new that the people that have learned a lot can teach a lot of people that know very little. And a lot of people are intimidated by it, but I was willing to, like I said, start small and take some steps and learn a lot along the way about you know what to do and what not to do. Yeah, we should add some of those uh, resources in the uh, podcast notes for people if they're interested in following up with the book or maybe some of those groups. So it's very encouraging, actually, that someone like yourself, uh, I know you mentioned the other day you had a history history degree or something. I have a master's in history. <laughs> master's? Okay, with a master's in history that can go on and deliver this on a DIY basis. So I think that's quite impressive. And it shows you that it's, as you say, it's not actually that complicated if you want to, you know, like take the time and learn how to do this. So let's go a little bit into the details of what these systems look like. You mentioned the panels. Can you basically just walk us through how the system works and end to end sure so if you if you talk about a permanent setup basically we're not talking about the jackeries which is all in one so if you buy the components you can buy a kit or you can buy everything truly piece by piece and i started with a kit so my kit came with three solar panels which you know get mounted on the the roof of your trailer and if you're talking about putting it on the roof you have to be careful when you're poking holes in the roof that you waterproof things because you do not want it penetrated and leaking into your trailer. So you put the panels on the roof, then you're running wires inside the trailer and the wires are going to go into a charge controller, which basically takes that energy from the panels and it sends it on down the line in a way that's needed by, usually you're going to have batteries. It would be very unusual not to have batteries in the setup because otherwise, as soon as you get some clouds, you don't have any energy and you're cut off. So usually you're, my system came with one large battery and i added a couple more and the batteries are heavy but these are lithium ion batteries and so the charge controller can put energy into the batteries when the sun's out you're making energy you're filling up those batteries and then the other piece of it that you're usually going to get is an inverter because laptop computers and all those things that have three plugs need to go into here in the u.s it's going to be 110 to 120 volts and you know, across the pond, it's going to be 220 volts, but you need to change the energy so that you can actually use it because the way that the panels are making it and the charge controller and the battery, the battery is a DC pad battery. So I was working with a 12 volt battery and you need to change that up so you can actually use the energy. And then at the end of it, what you do get is a bunch of plugs, I guess, or something that you can plug your devices in, right? Right. It, it depends what type of inverter you get. What, the one that I started with, I actually had to wire that into a power strip. So then that power strip has energy, which will work off of the solar energy if you're making it at the time and or the battery. So if you don't have enough solar coming in, you'll pull off the battery and use that and deplete it. And then as soon as you stop using it or if you're making enough energy off of the panels, 
you'll simultaneously power your devices and charge the batteries. Just to sort of like pull everything together here, we started talking about the Jackery. Now we're talking about sort of like a fixed installation power system with the panels and, and the inverters and all of that stuff. And I guess in terms of numbers, you know, in terms of sizes, we're measuring these things in kilowatts and kilowatt hours and whatever. So you want to give us like a rough idea, both on the consumption side, what you would need, and basically on the production side, what each of those systems capacities sort of come out as. So like how how you match the two. Right. So my trailer, which now has essentially three different systems. Um, Two of them come together and then there's one that's completely by itself. So I have some redundancy there and I now have 14 panels on my roof and it's full. That's all I can squeeze up there. They're all permanently mounted. So I have 11 of the 100 watt generating solar panels and I have three that are 170 watt. Um, And obviously they're different manufacturers, slightly different mounting mechanisms, but it doesn't really matter. So I can generate in theory, 1.6 kilowatts. So I started out in watts. And once we get over a thousand watts, all of a sudden I get to say I'm generating kilowatts, which, you know, is an exciting threshold to cross. And just to sort of like match that to a surface area, do you have any idea roughly what kind of total surface area those panels take up? That is a good question. The, The small ones, I think, are 40 inches by 20 inches. And the larger ones are something like 50 by 25. I have a 16 by 8 trailer with a V-nose. So that size trailer can accommodate this many panels. I have an air conditioner up there, which kills some real estate. <laughs> I could squeeze a few more panels in if I didn't have the air conditioner up there. And you said that in theory, you're generating around 1.6? Yes, 1,600 watts. So that's the power, right? We should say watts is power. What hours is energy? Yeah, that's the theoretical power. Now, you're never going to get 100%. Uh, Part of it is, you know, the angle of the sun, the sun, you know, where I am, it's never directly overhead. So you're not getting like an ideal. You look at people always put them on their houses on an angle, and then you can do much better. I wasn't going to angle them on my trailer because it's uh, it's parked in different locations. And the mechanics of making adjustable angled panels for my trailer were way above what I felt comfortable tackling. Okay. So I could live with some degree of like, I'm not getting 1.6. I might be getting on a good day, 1.1, 1.2 maybe. Oh, that much lower than sort of like optimal. 60 to 70%. Yeah. And in the winter, you know, winter, it'll be worse. Obviously, the higher the sun, the better you do. Okay. So you're getting a maximum capacity of 1.6 kilowatts, which typically will give you between 50 to 70%, depending on the weather, cloud cover and all of that stuff. Right. And then in terms of your energy capacity, basically the batteries, how much total energy they can store, what's what's that? So I have four large 12-volt batteries, which are 200 amp hours. Don't need to get worried about amps and all that stuff in this discussion unless you really want to. But roughly it's 10 kilowatts of storage. So I can store about 10,000 watts of energy in those batteries. Okay. And now in terms of how that, how adequate that is for your needs... Can you match that to, let's say, a typical event that people might be able to understand? Basically, you know, you go out and you time a 5K or a 10K. How do the two sort of like sides match up? If I'm wearing just my basic timing hat, whether it's fully automatic timing with cameras or chip timing or both, you know, I've got a, I've got a couple of computers. I might have some cameras. I've got a monitor in the trailer. I have, I have a switch. I've got a clock plugged in. All those things, I can run all day. That's no problem at all. I mean, you'd have to look at each individual piece and what they're pulling, but you know, your laptop might pull 100 watts. Um, your, your monitor might pull you know, 100 watts. The switch is pulling less than that. So all these individual items might be 20 to 100 watts. There's very little that's going to pull more. If I have an inflatable arch, for example, the blower on that is 240 watts. So you know, I can run that, that blower for 40 hours off of the batteries. That's if I'm not even pulling any solar in. So I can go all day when I'm just timing. As I said before, the bigger pieces are if you start plugging in, say, 2000 watt speakers, you know, we have three 200, 2000 watt speakers that we use at events when we're managing. I don't know when or if we ever actually use 2000 watts, but if you have three of those plugged in, you're not going to make it too long. So if you need to do an all day marathon and you're running three of those, then 
what I have is not going to be enough. What would you do in that case? You would fire up the generator or? Yeah, fire up the generator. So we have a 9,500 watt beast of a generator that we lug around and we almost never use, but occasionally we do have to fire it up. Okay. Now, the other angle is um, cost that I, I'm, I'm sure people would would love to get some idea of, of how much all of this costs. Can you give us sort of like a few ballpark numbers starting from the from the entry point Jackery setup all the way to something closer to what you have today? Yeah, the Jackery systems, as far as just storage, so if you don't get any panels, uh, and they're on sale now for a substantial discount with Amazon Prime Day or something like that, but nor- their normal pricing, uh, I believe, is about a dollar per watt. So if you get a thousand watt Jackery unit, it usually costs about a thousand dollars. The 240, the one I started with, is usually on sale for two hundred dollars. The 1500 watt one that they sell is somewhere around 15 or 1600 dollars. And then if you buy panels to generate solar energy into that, the panels cost a couple hundred dollars per panel. And the panels are like 100 watt foldable panels they can stow away easily and they're softer they're not the hard basically plexiglass ones that get mounted on the roof in a permanent install so have you gone through the calculation of over a period of time what that money might save you in terms of gas costs or anything like that like i'm thinking cost only is this kind of thing worth it to save money right now probably not i i i have not crunched the numbers. I have chalked some of this up as a hobby. So that gives me some leeway to spend money that isn't in a purely economic standpoint. I also can't really put value on whether anybody cares that, you know, we're a green timing company and management company. I don't know if anybody's going to hire us just because of that. Uh, But a bigger piece is just that, you know, it's been a really enjoyable hobby. And so I'm willing to waive some of the pure dollars and cents decisions because of that piece of it. Okay. Okay, it makes sense. I mean, yeah, if it's your hobby, you, you're gonna you're gonna split the budget into the into the hobby side of things as well. Now, in terms of, you know, these systems basically, what I would have thought, they, they are, I guess, in their evolution, the technology is a little bit like any other electronic equipment, which means that they must become obsolete fairly soon, in the sense that you know. You go out, you buy a panel today, maybe a couple of years from now, there's a much better panel at maybe half the price kind of thing. Sort of like I'm thinking TVs, these things come and go and they become cheaper all the time. Is that the case with with this kind of setup? I believe that the panel cost comes down in large part because more people get into it. So there's greater you know, economy of scale. There's more competition. There's more companies making panels and components than there used to be. So the, the competition and the amount that's made is pushing the panels down, but it's not the same trajectory as computing power, you know, for laptops or monitors that, you know, get cheaper and bigger and better at such a rapid pace. I don't think they've changed that much. I I follow some solar groups in Facebook and people talk about getting their hands on 20 year old panels and, you know, they still work. Okay, which is actually an interesting point for my for my next question, which would be the lifespan you'd get out, out of a system like this. You go out and you buy these components brand new today. How long can you expect them to last for you? The warranty on the panels, at least some of them, is 25 years. And on the batteries is 10 or 11 years. So the panels should outlast the batteries. Uh, I don't know if there's a degradation in terms of efficiency. So I don't know if 100 panels is going to draw less over time. I suspect that there's not going to be a significant degradation. The batteries will degrade to some degree for sure over time. I don't think that they go from working 100% down to nothing when you hit the 10 or 11 year mark. There's going to be some degradation there, but I think that the expectation is normally you can get, you know, 25 years out of panels and 10 years out of a lithium iron battery if you use it correctly, which is what exactly. So with panels you really can't do anything wrong other than have like a hailstorm or tree branch falls and then breaks it. Um you just use them and they work. With batteries and this isn't just lithium batteries comes into play with lead acid batteries as well. Batteries don't like certain behaviors. They don't like to be run down to completely drained often. That that shortens their lifespan. They also don't like to be charged when it's below freezing. Something about the chemistry and the batteries and crystallization going on in there. So you have to be careful to guard against going below the threshold. And 
Lithium batteries are popular because you can run them a lot lower without damaging them. Lead acid batteries are cheaper, they're heavier, but they'll also be damaged more easily if you run them below about 50%. So it might seem like, hey, I can buy a lot more lead. I don't care about the weight. I'm going to buy the, the lead acid batteries because they're cheaper. You don't realize that, well, you can't use as much as, um, as high a percentage of what you get out of that in terms of storage capacity. Well, you must get some freezing weather in Pennsylvania all the time. What do you do with uh, charging batteries in that kind of weather? So, you know, with the portable system, you just bring them inside, plug them in inside, or you just use them when the sun's out and it's, you know, above freezing, hopefully. With my trailer and the permanent installation, I had to take some preventative steps. And my initial plan was to put a kill switch in there, which would basically um, cut the power from the panels to the batteries when it gets cold enough. So I would go out there and just turn the switch. And now the panels are no longer sending energy to the batteries and that will protect them. And then I just have to switch it back on when it gets warmer. And in all my poking around the internet and seeing what other people are doing uh, and also seeing what you can buy out there, you can buy self-heating batteries and they cost a lot more money. Um, and th these are not, you know, small batteries that you put in your laptops, but these are like the large, you know, 50 pound lithium ion batteries. You can buy self-heating ones, which is going to add hundreds of dollars to the cost of each battery. What I saw that some people have done is you can buy a cheap heating pad that will run off of the battery. And if you can buy a cheap thermostat and wire that in, you can set it so when the temperature gets down cold enough that all of a sudden the battery will power this heating pad and you've basically made your own self-heating batteries except you can have one for example the thermostat cost me like ten dollars the heating pad was like fifteen dollars on amazon and then a little bit of wires um, the cost of that which could heat two batteries is um, so much less than buying you know two batteries that each cost two or three hundred dollars more to have the self-heating element and i also insulated the, the cabinets that the batteries in to try to trap some of that heat so you couldn't use it you know on the arctic circle to set up i'm sure the batteries <laughs> no matter what you do there but where i am where it rarely gets way 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 below freezing um, i should have protection but i won't really know until it gets down to those temperatures and i go out there and check and make sure my batteries aren't freezing and getting damaged so the problem with the batteries are they only struggle when they charge in cold weather but when they discharge there's no issues if you have let's say your jackery in freezing weather absolutely right you can use them much colder i don't know what the threshold is there's there is a point at which i believe even they could be damaged if it's cold enough i think uh, but a lot of the lithium ion batteries are popular in like the ice fishing world and i don't do ice fishing i've only come across it because in my research about you know what people buy and why uh, people talk about i've got this in my ice fishing cabin and the temperatures crazy cold and you know the batteries are still crushing it and in order to get the kind of life out of those components that you mentioned earlier which is you know like in the decades for some of them is there any kind of special maintenance you need to do on the panels or on the batteries or anything apart from charging them and using them as per the manufacturer's instructions right so if you get good equipment my understanding is that the solar charge controller which takes the energy from the panels and sends it over to the batteries what that actually does is it changes the voltage and it, it's actually like storing the battery, so to speak. It, it's, it's doing, it's not just getting it full and leaving it alone. It actually allows the battery to deplete and then recharges it. So it, it goes through four different cycles of what it's doing with the battery. And the purpose of that is to basically manage the battery. So you don't need to do anything. That's all taken care of by the charge controller and the good batteries have battery management systems, BMSs on them, which help make sure that they don't get too much and they shut off if they get too little and things like that. So it's all automated. Okay, that's great. For someone who might be interested in either selling some of their older components or someone who might be interested in in sort of like dipping their toe into this a little bit more um, slowly and, and buying secondhand components, is there is there a market for the kind of stuff where you might be able to buy them secondhand? I think very little. I think so many people want to get into the solar world that the people that would be willing to buy anything used will snatch it up as soon as it appears. There's, I mean, there's a market. People will buy it, but there's not a lot floating around. And, and the solar world hasn't been – it's not a mature marketplace. There haven't been people selling it for a long time. There's not many people that have had you know 20-year-old panels that they've had enough with. And, and if there are, people are usually still using them because why are you going to get rid of it? At this point, it's free energy. Exactly, yeah. So so are you happy uh, overall with your system, the build-out, how it performs, 
looking ahead using it so far? Yeah, I'm thrilled. I mean, it's got it's got some cool displays when you can see like how much energy are you making now and how much are you using? And when you see, you know, you're powering all your devices and you're still bringing in energy, like that's a great feeling. And I do a portable setup sometimes and I just take all my portable stuff and I bring it in my trailer and I plug it all in. So I charge it up off of, you know, the, the mothership, which is my, my trailer, which has all the, the permanent panels and the big batteries and all that. And do you have any plans for um, going bigger than this or sort of have you reached the end, the end of the road for you in terms of your needs, in terms of your own needs for power? I wouldn't say I've reached the end of it. There's a couple projects that I would like to do. My Some of my staff members who are scattered around with equipment still have and use generators, and I don't really like that. So I would like to pledge to be 100% solar for all of our timing operations. So if we're not using PA systems and the, the LED board that we have, if we're just using regular timing equipment, which doesn't draw like crazy, I would like to have that be 100% solar powered in the next year or two. And that would entail me either getting them jackeries or the next step would be for me to actually build like a knockoff jackery, like my own power station that I could plug in and charge and everything. Well, that's going to be interesting. Have you thought perhaps of, you know, besides the cost calculation, doing a kind of carbon footprint equivalent calculation for how much CO2 you're not releasing into the atmosphere by going solar with this? I have not. I probably should. I wouldn't know how to do that, but Perhaps I could figure out how to do it, or I need to bring in somebody that can help me figure out how to do that, because it would be nice to do. Yeah, it would be quite interesting. I remember going back to the college that I went to, which I'm out almost 25 years now, but I went back at some point. I think it was probably the time a cross-country meet there or something, and I went into one of the, the student union building, and they're very green now. They they weren't back when I was there, because – Nobody was using solar back then, but since they've gotten heavily into the solar world and they're truly carbon neutral and they actually have a display in the student union that shows how much extra energy they're making from their solar farm there that they're putting back on the grid. So they're drawing nothing and then they show how much they're they're putting back out there for other people to use this green energy. Um, and that resonated with me when I saw that some years ago. I thought that's pretty cool to do that on that scale. I mean, it would also be interesting because, you know, we did a couple of episodes and I'm continuing to learn about sustainability and how it works and how events get certified for, you know, being green and all of that. And my understanding is that if a race were to calculate its carbon footprint, the ancillary footprint of a timer or of another vendor they hire in is not part of, our, of that calculation. So, you know, you sort of, because otherwise it gets crazy, right? I mean, you try to calculate just the footprint of the immediate stuff that you do as a race. But I think it would be great for people to start factoring in the fact that, you know, they can have a more sustainable timing service and a more sustainable shirt provider and a more sustainable across all the different uh, vendors they work with. And and that's that's a great step forward. Yeah, absolutely. Even, yeah, maybe, maybe you'll have people knocking on your door uh, trying to learn the secrets of doing all this. Well, it was funny because I went to uh, help with an event about a month ago. Uh, there was a, a race that they were the chip timer. And because it was a U.S. championship, they were required to have FAT backup uh, for close finishes and record keeping. So, and they didn't have an FAT system. So I went out there and I provided just FAT backup, but I brought my trailer with me. Last year when I timed this for them, I just brought my truck and did not have the trailer. So I got out there and I had the trailer and the the timer there saw my setup and came in and said like, whoa, this is awesome. Can you outfit my van? My timing van was so, can I hire you to do this? And I just kind of laughed and said, you know, yeah, I'll give you some tips on how to do it. But, you know, whether that pans out or not, I, I doubt it. But I think people see that and they're like, wow, that's awesome. I, I really, you know, I like the idea of it. How many people will take the plunge? Hard to say, but, you know, people that see it, whether they're, you know, other timers or people at events that we're timing for, they see it and they say, you know, that's awesome. I really like that. So are you up for people reaching out, seeking advice with this stuff, sort of like on a on a peer-to-peer -peer basis? Yeah, pay it forward. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to do it. That's awesome. How can people reach you? They can shoot me messages through Facebook. They can email me if they want. We can, I don't know if we can put that on the sure. the notes on there. Uh, obviously, I can't spend all day every day talking solar. I love, you know, geeking out about it. And I, there's more I want to learn. So I, I have not found like a mentor myself yet, but there's certainly more layers to what I can learn. And if I can help other people, you know, get started on the journey, I'm happy to do it. Awesome. So looking back, is there anything 
that stuck out at you as like a particularly valuable lesson you learned through this? I mean, like just just the struggle and the technical side of things. Is there anything that people should know about when they get into this? Start small and build. You know, don't have if you're going to have a vision of the whole thing, like if I had said from the very beginning, I'm going to cover every inch of my roof with solar panels and I'm going to have this massive battery bank, you know, uh, something to rival a Tesla power wall. If I had done that, uh, I probably would have been in trouble because I learned things as I went along. For example, you know, the first system I bought was a 12 volt system. And when I put in my second system, I put in a 24 volt system and there's various reasons for that, and I won't go into it today, but that was one of the lessons that I learned. So my trailer now has one 12-volt system and one 24-volt system, and obviously I can I can use both of those simultaneously separately for for the same type of usage. So there's, there's little things like that. And am I correct in thinking that all of these components sort of you can – you can scale up in a modular kind of way that, you know, some things that used to be on their own, you get two of those or three of those. And like, it's almost, it, they almost scale linearly at some, at some point. Yeah, you really, I mean, that's what I did is I started with three panels on the roof and I hooked that up to one battery and one charge controller. And, you know, I looked at what I could power and I was like, well, if I had more, I could power these things too. Or I could go from, you know, to, for powering everything for six hours up to 12 or 24. And so I, I got another system and I added more panels and more batteries. One thing you have to be careful of is like, you're not supposed to use batteries that are different manufacturers, which I've done, I've broken that rule, but you're also not supposed to use batteries of different ages. So if you hook up, if you buy a battery and then you wait five years and buy another one and you wire those together, you can have some issues with the system not operating properly. Okay, okay. Lots of, lots of tricks of the trade there, I guess. And there's lots of tips I haven't learned yet because I've only been in this, you know, this year. And once I get, you know, more years into it and I see what what breaks or wears down or doesn't operate the way that I expect it to over time, I'm sure I'll learn a lot more. Well, keep us posted in the group where people will follow this, I'm sure, with uh, how the setup is going. Because as you say, you haven't really had it for a, for a long while. So you probably haven't seen everything there is to see in terms of, you know, what life can throw at you. And we all know that races and, and timers and stuff get thrown quite a few uh, curve balls. So who knows what happens down the line? Absolutely. Until then, I want to thank you very, very much for all this advice. I hope it was um, helpful to people listening in. So thank you very much for your time. Thanks for having me, Panos. Thank you very much to everyone listening in. And we'll see you all on our next podcast. I hope you enjoyed this bonus episode on going solar with my guest, 2L Ray Services, Lowell Ladd. You can find more resources on anything and everything related to race directing on our website, racedirectorshq.com. You can also share your thoughts about solar-powered setups or anything else in our Facebook group, Race Directors Hub. Many thanks again to our awesome podcast sponsor, Run Sign Up, for sponsoring today's episode. And if you enjoyed this episode, please don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast player. And do check out our podcast back catalog for more great content like this. Until our next episode, take care and keep putting on amazing races.